Hi, welcome again to the wonderful world of handball. My name is Ruby Obert, and just take a look at me. I don't know how old you think I am, but I've been playing this game for over 53 years. And what does that have to do with your enjoyment of the game? Well, what I'm going to show you today is, if you get fascinated with this game as I've been fascinated with the game, You'll have many, many decades of pleasure from this great and wonderful historic game. As you remember, it was started in Greece about 2,000 years ago, where they took a hair compacted ball covered with leather, and they tried to throw it through a hoop on a wall. Then about the late 1880s, a fellow by the name of Phil Casey modernized the version, and he said, why don't we play it in a room? The question now comes to, you see me before a one-wall court. One wall, you have to hit the ball more or less directly, straight lines. But in four wall, just picture this. There you are inside a room, working with basically six surfaces. So they always ask me, which is the tougher game to play? If the basic premise is that the ball is virtually always traveling about 90 miles an hour, and the player always has to be in motion to catch up to it, on a court like this, the one wall court, there are no side walls to stop the momentum of the ball. That means the one wall player has to be like a thoroughbred racehorse. He has to have the ability to run to both sides and still having the skill in either hand to catch up to the ball and then direct it to its proper place. Whereas in four wall, you could take that young thoroughbred racehorse, that agile young man who can run laterally and move with the speed of lightning, he'll wind up playing an elderly guy like me on a four-wall court. You know, a guy with white hair, looks like he can hardly move. And sometimes the young guy's embarrassed to ask the older guy to play a game. But the older guy always says, okay, and then the younger guy always thinks, well, I'll just hit the ball a little easier so the old guy doesn't have a coronary. But before you know it, the skill of the older person translates into this. He sees as that ball leaves the younger man's hand, and no matter how many surfaces it hits, intuitively, he knows where the ball is going to wind up. Consequently, he doesn't scout around, run around trying to follow the ball as the younger man would. He just perceives the ball on its trajectory and knowing some of the laws of physics about how a ball would rea react on a plane surface, he winds up at the appropriate spot to hit the ball by taking perhaps one, two, or three steps. Isn't that glorious? Isn't that beautiful? That's what we're talking about today. We may be on the one wall court, but all these same skills come into play. This game is not a question of using power, of directing this ball as hard as you can and then seeing what the consequences are. That's for a lower level of play, say in the parks, say in the schoolyards. But once you get into national championships, then there's a whole new concept. The whole new concept is how to maintain your stamina because if you keep running, ultimately you'll tire. So now we try and blend the physical and the mental and it's those two procedures that ultimately will make the champion. What does this mean to you as someone who wants to learn the game? This means, as I tried to demonstrate last time, not to use a physical effort to meet the ball because every time you meet that ball, you're using an amount of force equal to it. Your effort is to take the force in the ball and merely redirect it. And what does that redirection mean? It means how you use your hand and your wrist. As the ball is coming to this height, for instance, you just massage it back. 
you just massage it back and you keep practicing this technique until it becomes second nature. That's the overhand. Other shots will be the sidearm. You do precisely the same thing by moving the ball this way. Now, let's put this into perspective. I want to tell you about this great game of handball. I want to tell you about that in 1919, the first four world championship was held and it was won by Murder Ball Ranth. Talk about that name, Murder Ball Ranth. You know what his skill was? Just pounding that ball, blasting it virtually to smithereens until he annihilated his opponents. In the AAU, they were the ones, the Amateur Athletic Union, they were the ones who started an organized method of having national championships. So they organized the first four world tournament in 1919. They also organized the first one world tournament in 1924. The 1924 tournament was won by a more sedate type of guy. He wasn't a murder ball or a killer guy. He was a nice splendid man from the old sod. He was called Jack Burns. Now, Jack Burns was the first AAU champion. Over the time, though, tournaments were held in all areas of the country, at the Los Angeles Athletic Club, in the Detroit Athletic Club, in the New Orleans Athletic Club, at the New York Athletic Club. These were the main places where four wall was played. Where was one wall played? When the one wall tournament started, where was it played? It wasn't played all around the country. Of course not all around the country didn't have the magnificent facilities that New York City built. During the Depression, as you remember, 1,200 courts were built around the city, and that put idle men into a pleasurable pursuit so they wouldn't do anti-social acts. So now we have a feel of how one wall and four wall blended together. Now, you want to think about this. When we started these various tournaments, over time, in the 1980s, someone said, look, we've had a tremendous history of handball, we've had a glorious history of handball, we've had magnificent champions, why don't we start a Hall of Fame? So in the 1980s, a Hall of Fame was indeed started, and names like somewhat the public wouldn't really recognize but handball aficionados would instantly names like joe playtack who won seven nationals in a row names like vic hershkowitz who was the first to win the singles the national singles title in one wall three wall and four wall just imagine if you will for the moment of trying to perfect your skills in one wall finding yourself now in a four wall tournament where you're playing in a room and trying to use your one wall skills to master the game of four wall, which includes ceiling shots, back wall shots, and the like. Well, this man, a great champion, Vic Hershkowitz, was the first to win it in one wall, also three wall, which is a front wall with two sides, no back, and four wall. He was so great over his time that just recently, the, an international Jewish Hall of Fame was formed, and Vic Hershkowitz will soon be inducted into that Hall of Fame as one of the greatest Jewish all-round champions of all time. So, we talked about Joe Playtech, we talked about Vic Herskowitz, down into the modern era, we'll talk about fellas like Joe Derso, Steve Sandler, in four wall, Paul Haver, Vern Roberts, and the current champion who took away the title recently from the most wonderful, magnetic, skilled practitioners of the four wall game, Natty Alvarado. Natty Alvarado won nine out of the last 11 four wall singles championships. He also won some doubles championships with Vern Roberts. He came as a poor kid from Mexico. As a matter of fact, I can tell you this now, he was a wetback, he was here illegally. But he came to the United States and he was befriended by someone in Texas where they had four wall facilities. Natty showed his skills immediately. A very slim person with athletic ability written on his face. And you know what? A desire to excel because it was a way for him to survive. 
He put on handball exhibitions. He played in the tournaments. There's a pro tour for the last 10 or 11 years, started by the United States Handball Association. And now the first prize is $3,500. When Natty started, it was about 1000 but he was able to make a lot of money because he won all the pro stops in addition to the national championship. And then he got sponsorships, the uh, Champion Glove Company, the Saranac Glove Company, the Spalding Ball, the people who make the ball. Now, putting the pieces together, he used his athletic prowess and he used name recognition that some insurance company out in the Midwest took him on as a person who would be able to sell life insurance and put it through pension plans and buy-sell agreements and estate planning. So, after his career is now ended and taken over by the New York Athletic Club's John Bike, who recently won the singles in free wall and the doubles in free wall, he went on to dethrone Natty Alvarado, and I must admit, Alvarado is now 35, he has some elbow problems, but still, John Bike was able to play for one week straight, won the four wall singles and the four wall doubles too. Now the question is, the great Oscar Ogre was the only player to amass 42 national championships in one wall, three wall, and four wall. And even though I mentioned the great Vic Hershkowitz, he has 26 national champions. Oscar has 10 grand slams. That means, 11 grand slams, that means he won the singles and the doubles in the same week of competition. Hershkowitz, when we compare the records, great champion that he is, he wasn't able to make it too much in doubles because doubles has to do with teamwork. So Vic only had, was able to manage two grand slams. Takes away nothing from the skills, man. I'm trying to give you a feeling for the Hall of Fame. I'm trying to give you a feeling for how the game progressed. The Amateur Athletic Union during the mid-60s started tempering down about sponsoring four wall. And by 1951, the United States Handball Association with Bob Kendler, who was a builder from Chicago, he put all the pieces together to have a national association, the United States Handball Association, dedicated only to the furtherance of handball. Putting all this into perspective, we've had some wonderful byproducts from the game. We've had world championships where people from Australia, Ireland, Mexico, Canada, and even a transplanted American went to Africa, South Africa, and he represented South Africa. We had championships in 1964, 1967, and the like. My two brothers and I were lucky enough to be the national champions in 1967. It's the national champion that represents the country in the world championship, and my three brothers and I went up to Canada, to Toronto, and we were able to win those championships. Now, the world championship category is not that intense for a good reason. You, you try to get money together, you try to get sponsors together, and this happens to be the problem in trying to further handball. For instance, some people ask, why isn't handball on the Olympics? And another person will say, of course it is. And then I have to inform them that's field handball, which is similar to soccer. You don't kick the ball, but you throw it. There's a, a goal line and you fly through the air throwing the ball at the goalkeeper. That is not the handball I'm talking about. You need about 16 countries in order to have the sport recognized, in order to be part of the Olympic scheme. Now, why wouldn't it be worldwide? After all, you have the Great Wall of China where you can play handball, you had the Berlin Wall in Europe where you could play handball, and I'm sorry to say, even in Jerusalem, that's why you have the Wailing Wall. The players came there and they were really bad. Now, the next step is, I'm just going to momentarily show you what we spoke about last time, so you'll get a feel about how this game is played, and then I'll tell you a little bit how you start the game, something about the rules, things like that. So you don't go away, I'll just sort of be fading in the background here. This will only take a few seconds. You start by throwing the ball like this. You throw it as many times as you can. After you master throwing the ball, remember now you want to use the energy in the ball and redirect it. So this is how you redirect it. And as you start all over until you get it right. Side arm is this way. 
So you toss the ball like this, you hit the ball like this, the side of it. Now keep in mind, footwork is very important. If you don't get your feet in the right place, then you won't be able to strike the ball properly. So you want to keep that very much in mind. On the serve, you want to control it with one hand, make sure it bounces to the correct height, and you use this technique to strike it to the wall. Then you have the various types of serves, to the right, to the left, and so on. Now what does that mean so far as competition is concerned? It doesn't necessarily mean you hit the ball where your opponent isn't. If you play a very speedy opponent who's able to move laterally at great speed, in that case it may behoove you to hit the ball right at his feet. Then he won't know which hand to use in order to return it. You kind of keep that in mind. If you're playing against a power player, you might consider keeping the ball high putting a spin on it, changing the speed of the ball so he can't take his favorite shot. These are some of the basics that you have to know in order to improve your game. But the most important thing is you can have all the grandiose ideas in your mind about how to play the game. You can read all the books and be the most astute theoretician about how to play the game, but one thing is most important. If you can't put that into practice on the court, if you can't be in shape in order to run for the ball, then all these ideas and theories, you're living in an ivory tower. The game is won and lost on the court the same way the wars of England were won or lost on the fields of Eden. They were in shape. It, it goes back to the Greeks again, 2,000 years. They even coined a phrase, you know? Men sana incorpore sano, a sound mind in the sound body. So, one level of play is, is to develop power shots. Other levels of play is to develop skill and how to hit the ball. But if you only limit yourself to one of those aspects, you become a power hitter or a kill shot hitter, that is meaningless because in tournaments you get a wide variety of styles. The true champion is able to incorporate each basic style and at the appropriate moment know when to use it. So there'll be times when you lose, use a low serve, there'll be times when you use a high serve, and even in the same game, you may be losing to an opponent score-wise, but by midpoint, if he tires a little bit, that's when your game comes on stronger and ultimately you'll win. People say to me, you know, you happen to be a young-looking man. I'm not a young-looking man. See the white hair? But I'll tell you one thing, I've been playing this game for over 50 years, and the thing people always are amazed at, look, I'm going to take the jacket off like this as they do in the movies, see? You just take it like this and you flip it away. There's two things to consider, being lucky enough to be in a sport for many, many years, and the other thing is knowing how to take care of your body. They say, what do you do? What do you eat? How do you do it? Do you take vitamins? I say, and I'm not putting a put down on the vitamin industry, I say this, I read in a book once, that if you were to eat all the foods to get you all the vitamins, minerals, and trace elements to make you happy and make you healthy, you will find out that you'll be overweight. So what do I say? I say this, some people say, you know, push the food away from the table a little bit more. I don't think you have to do that. I think that if you combine physical fitness and a game like handball, burning off the calories by this beautiful game, your metabolism will be so finely tuned that ultimately you'll be able to eat anything you want. But I don't want you to think that you can uh, drink coffee and uh, smoke uh, to your heart's content. Maybe when you're 70, you should start that because then you won't have any problems uh, that being debilitating later on. But bear with me. Try and stay away from spices, salts, pepper, fried food. Try away, stay away from the extra slice of bread with the butter on it. Try and stay away from those big loaves of bread, you know, and a glass of wine and stuff like that. Unless you're in shape, and I eat all those things except the spices and the coffee and the pepper and the stuff like that, and I can eat anything. But you stay with the four basic food groups, you know, green leafy vegetables and carbohydrates, maybe pasta. Maybe even sometimes I can do this. I'll go into a store and I'll buy a big cheesecake and I'll devour that cheesecake. Sometimes I'll go right down here to our neighbor, just a little beyond the uh, aquarium, 
We have all these wonderful exhibits for the kids, the whale. Just recently, a new baby whale was born. But if you go farther west, guess what you see? You see Nathan's. And Nathan's is beautiful. They have pizza and they have hot dogs and things. But I don't want you to become such a person of such low uh, self-restraint that you're going to go there. I'm saying that if you get yourself into shape, hopefully I think I'm in shape because I can hit the ball and move the ball around, then that reward, maybe once a week, maybe once every two weeks, you can have some pizza, you can have some mashed potatoes, you can have a nice wedge of roast beef, but otherwise stick to fruits and juices, stay away from the fats and the fried foods because it's very hard to digest anyway. Work out, get oxygen, don't stuff yourself in a room where you're breathing the same air. I'm an outdoor person. I've been at this for over 50 years, as I told you. I always love it outdoors. The beauty of this game is, if you come to love it as I do, it can be winter, spring, fall, or summer. We come out here in the winter time and we shovel the snow. And sometimes we even take off our jackets, just like the polar bears go swimming. We start and we're dressed like this and we play our beautiful game of handball. I'm not going to elongate this section without saying I want to thank again Matthew Powers for being patient to try to bring the message of handball to everyone. I want you to think about this. I want to put it in the form of a little song, you know? But before I give you that little song, I want to make a challenge. I want to challenge every professional athlete, every professional athlete, to come down here to West Fifth Street, and I will show them how the game of handball is to, is, is to be played. And at 57, this is a challenge, all you folks, come down here and see if you can beat me. And any proceeds will go to the New York City Public School Fund that I can continue to put on handball clinics for, I've already done it over the last 11 years for over 60 of the 90 public and private schools in this area. God willing, if I stay healthy, I hope to continue that. So the challenge is out there. It's up to you to come down and see what is this old guy all about. And now in ending, I'd like to just give you a little song. A, a little bit of a song. Go something like this. Thanks for the memory, the handball games we played, the places that we stayed, the wonderful and fabulous friendships that we made. Thank you so much. Try to remember Joe Playtech, relive Vic Hershkowitz, add in a Jimmy Jacobs, and you'll have those handball hits. And thank you, Alvarado. Sandler and Durso too. Don't forget the Oberts bringing those handball thrills to you. And thank you, New York City, for all these years of fun. That's why throughout the world, you and you and you and you, you're number one. Thank you, and I'll see you on our next segment. into the picture. What he's going to do now is serve the ball. He's going to use his best instinct as to what will make me either miss his serve or to get a weak return so that he can score the point. Now he is he's an aficionado of this sport. So I guarantee you he's done a lot of thinking about what strategy he's going to employ. Paul, I told you before, it's physical fitness. It's knowing how to play the game. It's constantly practicing so that you can control the ball correctly to make the shot that you want on your terms rather than his terms. So Matthew's going to begin by serving the ball. Let's see what happens.
so far. He made a fundamental mistake. There, I want him on this side. I can't blame him for that because while I was warming up, he was fiddling with the camera, so he didn't warm up again. And I knew that. That's why I wanted him to start right away. Remember, to start this game, you have to warm up. His first error was to hit the ball to my right hand. If he knows that I know how to play this game, the fundamental thing a server thinks about is first hitting to the opponent's weak hand, namely my left hand. So as you correctly saw, he hit it to my right hand. It wouldn't have been so bad if he had more power on it to keep me off balance. But not only did he serve it to my right hand, it was with not enough power to keep me off balance. So therefore, I was able to strike the ball and put it to the corner and ultimately win the volley. So, lesson one. Don't make that fundamental mistake of hitting it to your opponent's strong hand. Unless you want to be clever and you're at such a level that if your opponent thinks that you're going to hit it to his weak hand, maybe that's the appropriate time to hit it to his strong hand. You get that? Don't get confused, just watch. Here's Matthew. Before he goes to his next serve, let's see if he can decipher anything I say. Well, I think you're right. I made a mistake, but on the other hand, I think I'd rather hit the ball too deeply. And I can't suffer too much if I keep the ball in my head. Matthew just raised another interesting question about serving. This is called the no man zone. Okay? It's about three feet past the short line and three feet inside the long line. It's called the no man zone because any place you serve a ball in this area, your opponent will have enough time to get into position to whack it and get the serve away from you. So keep this in mind. He raised an interesting point. If you're going to serve, try and keep it just over the short line where your opponent has to run in and maybe just push and he'll be vulnerable to another shot by the server to put you out, or if you're going to hit it near the long line, push it at the long line to force him back. But any place in here, especially to the man's strong hand, is really a waste of time. So keep that fundamental in, in mind. I'm sure Matthew's going to keep that in mind. Let's see what his next serve is. While Matthew is getting the ball, <laughs> you see what happened there? Matthew is a left-hander. So this sort of puts another light on the relationship between two right-handers playing or a right-hander playing a lefty. Being left-handed, he correctly put the ball to my left hand. So what he was thinking about then, taking into account the rule of the server always looking back to see what the receiver is going to do with the serve, Sometimes they stand like that and they don't know what's happening. The idea is to see what your opponent is doing. I moved the ball back to try and get him out of position. His job was to keep the center court. The reason I sent him away is he gets so embarrassed when he finally scores a point. Uh, he'll ask another question. Yeah, I was trying to keep it over to the left, obviously. And it seemed to me that, that you were, as, as you sent me to the right, you were taking charge. You were controlling the game at, at, at that point. That volley to the right. So there was a kind of an interchange there where you were aware that I was trying to do something and you were counting on it. The first thing I was aware of, he's left-handed and he served the ball high to my left hand to try and keep me out of position. Knowing he had control of the center court, I knew that I couldn't return the ball with force. Because the faster I return it, the faster he reacts to it, and since he's in center court, the likelihood is he's going to win that volley. So what was going through my mind as I saw him serving it high to my left, I just nonchalantly used off speed with my left hand to make the ball sort of float to the wall. As the ball is floating to the wall, that allows me to move in behind him to play the next shot. So that he's raised another interesting point about what the serving strategy is and how a receiver is to react to that strategy. Sometimes it doesn't make sense to return the serve as hard as you can. Sometimes it makes sense to return the ball in a lofting fashion and as it's floating back to the wall, 
you move into center court to be in control of the volley. You come up right behind your opponent, and no matter what he does, basically, you'll be in a better position than having had struck the ball hard, and he puts the ball away right away. Following us? Okay. I always feel on the serve that if you get the point to think, instinctually react on the river, it gives you a kind of game. Oh, okay. Rephrase that again. If, if you can get him to think, how am I If you can get who to think? The receiver? Yes. Okay, you're serving. I'm and serving. Now you want to get him to think. I want him to think. About I'm what? Serving. How am I going to do That's this? critical. I'm yes. serving. Because Everybody, I'm serving. Okay, yeah. yeah. Because if I can get him to think, it will it 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 will start to interrupt the rhythms of this game. Interesting. Yeah. It's almost as if instead of the game being played here, it starts to be played here and so it's good. Excellent point. Is is there any truth to this? Well, you know, you raised the question here, and there's an underlying premise that has to be talked about before we even get to the thinking part. Keep in mind. When you are the server, you have 100% control of that ball. You have 100% control of where you are going to direct it. You have 100% control of the middle portion of the court. Because by being in the service area, your opponent is in the back, you're in the front, and all things being equal, no matter what he may attempt to do, you will be in control of his return. So taking those two pieces together, number one, you have total control of where the ball will be hit to start that rally. What a tremendous advantage that is. So it relates to what Matthew said. How do you use that advantage to keep your opponent guessing as to what you're going to do? My brother Carl is a perfect example of that. He had tremendous hop serves. That means the ball hits the floor and it either goes in that direction or it goes in that direction. He was so clever playing a mind game against his opponent. He would purposely put three shots where it hit the floor and come this way, three shots going this way, three shots coming this way, and when the opponent receiver thought the fourth one would go this way, he positioned himself in order to anticipate that. My brother Carl would make the ball go that way, the opponent moved this way and the ball flew over there. Then he used the opposite of that. He would throw three going this way and the opponent be ready for the fourth one moving in that direction and guess what happened? The ball bounced and hit him in the stomach. <laughs> and that's very embarrassing in championship play. But my brother Carl used that ability, as Matthew alluded to, a mind game. This is not just a physical activity. It's a mental activity in knowing strategy, but it's a psychological activity in order to figure out what your opponent is or is not thinking and how you can capitalize on that to your advantage. Now, if you're in the first progress of a week-long tournament, it doesn't have that much relevance because the level of the competition isn't that strong. But if you play for an entire week, and you're sort of physically depleted. When you get physically depleted, you start getting emotionally and mentally depleted. That's where you have to be at your best. In other words, what you have to do is save some of the physical energy for the later round, but not saving it to the extent that you don't make it to the later round. And when you get there, through experience, through many tournaments, through many styles of play, all this comes into focus in the mind's eyes. And you look at a physical being, your opponent, but there's an aura about you that allows you to be a spellbinder. In other words, to move in such a fashion that he will hopefully, hopefully become helpless as you advance to the championship. Is, did I get close to what you were talking about? Yes, that was fine. Yeah. You are always where the ball is When you talk about how is it that you are watching, you know, that you assume the ball is hitting, how come you're always in the right place? One of the great skills about this game and advancing in this game, to go on to become a champion, is something we alluded to before. 
if you've seen your opponent before in other contests, you have to take that in information into your mind and hopefully use it to your advantage. If you haven't seen him, then you play the match, it unfolds, you watch his various moves, and then you get an idea of what his favorite shot is. How does he react when you hit a ball low to the right? Does he have the flexibility and the lateral movement in order to make those moves? How does he react all of a sudden if he changes the speed of the ball? Is he uh, perplexed? Well, all these pieces fit into what's called anticipation. It looks like a great skill. I'm pretty sure it is a great skill. Some people are born with it. Some people have a, a, are more aware about their surroundings and the movement of the player on the court. So putting that into the proper context of what Matthew is saying, that I seem to have this skill, it's purely observation with this little additional piece of information that you need. You don't react to the ball. You don't just watch the ball being struck and then look at its trajectory and then start to move. I guarantee you that if you stand still, watch your opponent hit the ball, and then you decide to follow it on the wall to try and play it, it'll be too late. So the skill he's talking about is, is an ability to observe body language of your opponent. It's not just a question of him moving toward the ball and striking it. What you look for is, how are his feet pointed as he's coming into contact with the ball? You should know by the time his hand is this far from actual contact of the ball, you will have studied his body position, his feet, and everything else about him, any special athletic characteristics that he has, as he comes to striking that ball now, you will already be moving toward the spot where that ball must go. There's no two ways about it. So he gives it a beautiful name, anticipation. He gives it the aura of great skill. It's really something that has to be within you, the power of observation. We have players down here, they're in great physical condition muscles, you know, and very powerful, and they train all the time. But there's one problem. They whack the ball, and then they stop, and they watch the ball go into the wall. And then they watch the ball go into their opponent, and then they watch the opponent hitting it, and they're still stable. And then when the opponent hits it, a little message goes to their brain, says, oh, there it goes. And then they proceed with all their great strength and energy, and they find virtually virtually impossible to play the shot. What am I saying? It's wonderful to be in condition. It's some people go into weight training for strength. Some people run the boardwalk in order to get their legs in shape. My own particular philosophy is you don't go into weight training because weight training, the mind plays tricks on you. The more you use weights, the more you want to use weights, the more you want to get more weights. Now, weight training is good for body conditioning only to a certain extent. My first personal philosophy is you only do moves and exercises that are related to handball. For instance, when I exercise, this is the shot for the underhand in handball, right? So what I do, I do exercises like this. And you know what that does? It moves the hips, you start reducing the weight around the, uh, the love handles over here, and you're getting in position with your body for the appropriate shot in the handball. For the overhand, you'll start making moves like this. You'll do exercises like this. And you just stay loose, you stay flexible. You don't have to be a weightlifter that he gets in such great shape that he moves after the ball like this and he can't do anything. The same with running. Some of the champions, they say, boy, you know, I run a lot of track. When you're running a lot of track and doing jogging and running, it's great for the lungs, but it plays tricks on your legs. Because as you're running straight ahead, you're strengthening these muscles, which is great, but there is no strengthening of these muscles and ligaments and tendons for lateral movement. So we had a former champion. He was getting into his 40s. He still wanted to play. He says, hey, Ruby, you know what I'm going to do now? I always used to lose championships because I ran out of breath. I'm going to run the boards, and these were the board walk right here. And he was running and running and running and running, and after a number of months, he came back, he says, boy, I'm in terrific shape. And we got on the court, and we started playing a couple of rallies, 
and which is my style, as Matthew knows, I like to move the guy from side to side so he has to run as much as he has to and tire him. So my good friend and former champion got into the rallies and he was moving this way and he was moving that way. And unfortunately he collapsed. His knee gave out because in running this way he was building the lungs and the quadriceps, but he didn't take account of the tendons and ligaments over here. What he should have done in running, perhaps, if at all, was to run like this, you see? That may have been helpful. What am I saying? I'm saying, basically, the game of handball is so beautiful. In my opinion, what this gentleman calls, like, a Fred Astaire move. You know, you're moving with the ball, and it's sort of graceful, and there's a symmetry, and there's a symphony about this athletic movement. In my judgment, the only movements you should make is playing the game, getting into that feel of how your body reacts to a particular ball, and then if you want to do a little exercise at home, because maybe it rained and you couldn't get outdoors to play, then you do exercises like this, you can do exercises like this, you can even do a little bit of this, because the strength on the overhand comes from the shoulders, but always end up by doing this. See? You notice how I'm stretching? I'm also taking account of getting my back strengthened as I can. All these add up. Another thing you might want to think is of is stomach isometrics. See, I'm standing here. It looks like my stomach is perfectly flat. But as I'm walking during the day, getting some exercise, I'm doing this. I'm actually pulsating as I'm walking, and that's giving me some muscle strengthening technique. Because in this game, if you're not physically fit to play seven day games in a, days in a row where the games and matches get tougher as you proceed because the skill level goes higher and higher, if you're not physically fit and you don't have the psychological and emotional stability to stay in that stress situation, namely you're in conflict and there's something called noradrenaline that flows through your brain and your body that leaves you there because you have to stay, as opposed to adrenaline, which makes you flee under a stressful situation. All these things just sort of come together, like the, uh, the great Nobel Prize winners, the, the DNA helix, the way it comes together and then unfolds. That's what this is all about. And the bottom line is, as my good friend Matthew Paris knows, you can be as physical as you want, you can hit the same shot a thousand times. If you don't have a joy for the game, if you don't have fun in this game, because the fun part relaxes you so you're not under stress when you have to make the shot, even though you're in competition, the great champions at the moment of truth, they were always at ease. It's like karate and the martial arts. The guy isn't stressful as he's going forward, He's at ease until the moment of impact. I do the same thing with the punch shot and handball. Most guys go like that when they want to punch the ball and they put stress here and it takes energy. That was the wrong move. It takes energy over here. What I tell them about is you leave your hand relaxed until the moment of contact. The glove acts as a cushion. So your hand is relaxed and as you're coming forward to hit the ball, it's at the moment of truth. Ah! Like that. You don't have to say that, but that's to what happens. And you get the added impact of your entire being focused to the point of contact. That, you know how they break those boards? You know how they break those cinder blocks? Number one is they aim through it. They don't stop at the surface of the cinder block. The mind tells them that they have to aim through it, and therefore the force goes right through. The same thing in handball. You don't stop here and hit this ball right here. You have to be knowledgeable enough and experienced enough through many, many times of practice and getting into competition of swinging through the ball. Not hitting Matthew, but swinging through the ball. That's where the leverage of the body is. Its weight starts from the back and it comes right forward to the point of impact where your entire body is moved into the ball. If you were to stop your motion right here, nothing will, much will happen with the ball. It's when you follow it through with your body. That makes the critical difference between the hackers and the champions. Matthew's next question. That's a great answer.
You know, so that's why you can concentrate on the smoothness and the beauty of the game first, because how relaxed you are until I'm, and I presume you feel great as, as you do this. No question about it. What happened to the ball? Uh, I, I, I just want to take one additional second here. Could, could we have the ball? And we alluded to this the last time. Thank you, Matthew. That's some throw. Now remember, this is a game of grace. Beauty is athleticism, but like I like to say, there's also a Fred Astaire aspect. In other words, your movement toward the ball, like Nureyev going through the air. It's all grace, there's dignity, there's composure, and yet the end result is a beautiful athletic byproduct, namely striking the ball in such a way that you feel good when you know everything is just right. It doesn't happen all the time. Sometimes you're a little off, but when you get that one feeling. One time I punched the ball, it was on a summer day, and I said, how hard can I punch this ball? And everything was just perfect. I approached the ball with full strength, and I made that ball go like a rocket and hit my opponent in the stomach, and I split my nail, and the nail hasn't healed back till that time. That's the amount of energy that I was able to focus in that one shot. But look at the grace and the dance aspect of this. Watch my feet as I keep moving it according to what the ball does. You always must be in proper position to hit it successfully. Even if you're moving at an angle, you still must move your feet in such a way that you get behind the ball. If you swing out like this, most likely you'll hit it to the beach. So keep in mind, as the ball is moving to the wall, I'm making minor adjustments in the position of my feet so I'll be in the best possible position to strike the ball. I'll only show you the overhand. I'll close the ball up like this. Now, as you know, that wall isn't perfect, this floor isn't perfect, and I'm not perfect, so it may seem like that. The ball is always making little modifications. To the novice in this game, he only sees a flat object coming to him. The professional and advanced player actually sees the ball spinning and making little moves in the air. You get that by constant practice. You actually see the ball spinning. That's where the skill level increases. Because as your opponent moves it with spin, you moving very rapidly toward him have to make the adjustment to hit it. And that all relates to the feed too. Now watch. No matter what that ball does, I'm going to hit it in such a way that even if it goes to an angle, I'll try and pick it up a little bit. See this? I'll try to pick it up. But watch the feet, you see? Now watch. And now if it goes to the left, I move this way and I move it this way. See that? Are you watching? We're ready. <laughs> That's the secret to this game. You know why people can't advance in this game? Because they find it boring in order to hit the same shot over and over again. We alluded to this last time. The bowler practices 300 shots down the lane. The golfer hits it two or three hundred times practicing. The tennis player hits it well, hundreds and hundreds of times. Why? Not because they want to, because they have to. Inside their mind, they know that they must be aware of what this ball can do. Like my brother Carl says, the ball tends to be a magician. It tends to play tricks on you. You have to be skilled enough, like young people are, they always know when a uh, magician is doing a trick. You can't fool a kid because they look at the obvious. But adults are fooled because they say, look at this, and meanwhile he's doing something here. Well, this ball tends to do that. It makes the belief that it's coming straight to you and you just hit it. But it's always doing tricks. Your job is to keep practicing, keep controlling it, keeping your footwork correct, keeping your body in the right position, and constantly stroking the ball, whether it's overhand, sidearm, or underhand. So, watching again the footwork. You must watch the footwork. See? Now, if it goes to the side, you switch. If it goes over to this side. At the angle, you move it over. See that? I'm like a dancer. See that? I'm actually dancing. Okay? Remember this. With the right hand, if you're a right-handed player, there's only an overhand, a sidearm, and an underhand. With your left hand, your opposite hand, there's only two shots. Only an overhand and an underhand. 
As your skill level increases, you'll be able to make all the shots from whatever angle. You'll be able to punch it from any angle with both hands. But at the learning level, with your opposite hand, your left hand if you're a right-handed player, there's only an underhand shot and there's only an overhand shot. So for the overhand, you practice the throwing motion, and for the underhand, you just practice a modified play like this against the wall to make sure that the focal point is in the shoulder and your hand comes like a pendulum only in one plane. Not in every other plane, only in one plane. And if you take the underhand shot and you want to punch it with your opposite hand, always allow the ball to descend because as it's descending, it's losing its motion. And if it loses its motion and energy, that puts you in better control than it. Okay? These are just little observations. But if you put them all together and you string all these observations together over time, perhaps you'll even make notes about something you learn. Study those notes, learn from it, go out and observe other players, and before you're before you're even aware of it, you become the consummate player. Okay? Now Matthew has another question. Yes, I do. As always, being an aficionado of the game, he raises these exquisite, uh, sometimes philosophical questions. But I've mulled this over over the years myself. It always is amazing to me how the human body will age on the outside. And if you get to be 70 or 80 years old, it's sort of like you have carbuncles and barnacles on the bottom of your hull. And yet I've asked this question of people in their 80s and 90s and even some people who have made the 100 mark. I said to them in effect, isn't it amazing? And I want you to corroborate this for me because I have no way of knowing that as the body ages, the pure crystalline perfect structure of your mind, as you perceive that inner flame, which we call the homunculus, that inner voice, or perhaps your soul, how crystal clear, like a shiny globe of transparent steuben glass, how crystallized that is and how pure, with no blemishes, no barnacles. Tell me, sir, I'm asking this person who's in his 90s, is that true? And the person, having never heard the question before, will reflect. And the answer is, assuming Alzheimer's or some disabling thing doesn't happen to you, and you have a moment of clarity and lucidity in your inner being which you can reflect upon, the answer is a resounding yes. The body and the mind and the soul are so perfectly put together that your awareness, if you're lucky enough to contemplate that one moment of your life, that will be a true moment of happiness. And it all relates to the game of handball too, or whatever activity you have in life. No matter how complex a situation may look, if you can just step back and simplify for that one brief moment, and uncloud your mind, and use your best thinking mechanism to analyze that particular problem, you'll find out that you break it down into little pieces, and all of a sudden the problem is not that complex. The game of handball is the same way. If you were to look at the rule book and you say, my God, how am I going to know the rules? If you were to go into a four wall court and start seeing the ball going all around the walls, you'll say, how will I ever be able to play all those shots? It was like me as a kid. I learned to play the accordion. And I saw 120 buttons on the left side. And I had a little place on this side to play the keyboard. And I learned to play the accordion. And I did a big number on all the people who saw me. They would say, how do you know which button to hit of all those 120 buttons? And I divulged the secret. One button has a little depression. That's the C button. And if you go to the next line above that, it skips a note. The one after that is a D. And if you skip another note, the next one is an E, and so on. And then when you go down the other line of buttons, which are right even with the C note, 
You'll find out that the next one is C minor. You'll find out the next one is C7. And you'll find out the next one is C diminished. But keep this all in mind. If you have a piano keyboard, and my great friend Matthew Paris is a piano virtuoso. I've seen him play. I love the way he plays. I love what he brings to playing the piano. It's like what I'm trying to bring to handball. What you learn then is, you don't play 188 keys on the piano. You sort of limit yourself into something like that. The same way with the 120 keys on the accordion. You don't play them all. You stay somewhere within an octave and you play variations of C7, C minor and the like. That's what handball is about. You don't look at the rule book and say, how am I ever going to learn this game? You don't look at plays and say, how am I going to get all those skills? Like everything else, you start with the basics. You start as Matthew and I start, by practicing throwing the ball, by practicing striking the ball, by going on to practicing serving the ball, by going on to figure out what strategy is about. And you know through it all, what happens to you, after it's all said and done and you finish, your beautiful mind comes into play. It's called the runner's high where endorphins sort of curse through, course through your entire system, giving you that feeling of euphoria. You know your muscles may ache, you know may, you may be physically fatigued, but the mind has been raised to a new level of awareness about life and the wonderment of the world, the wonderment of sport, the wonderment of music. That's what we're talking about. We're not talking about a ball and someone hitting it against the wall. We're talking about rapture, euphoria, symphony, joy. I've been at this game for over 50 years. I'm having more fun now than I ever did in my life. You know why? Even though I can't perform with the great champions now because they're younger, you know, if I could move as team. well as they could, I would still be able to beat them in my mind's eye and on the court. But you know, age sets in, it slows us down a half step. But with the accumulated knowledge that you get over many years of tournament play, and you have the ability to, to bring that into focus when you're in a particular match, that's what the glory of the game is. That's what the glory of life is, no matter what your job, no matter what you do. If you put it into the proper perspective, reminds me of a story about an elderly gentleman. You know what his job was? His job was to go outside an office building every morning and shine the standpipe, the, the brass standpipe, which was outside the building. And for 30 years, that's all, I don't know if he had ability to do anything else, but he had to survive, he had that job. And every morning he went out, rain or shine, he took his instruments, he took his washcloths, his rags, and his little chemicals, and he polished that, and you passed that Bennett building. It was the most magnificent building you saw, not because of the brickwork and the glass, but your eye was attracted to something unusual. Most standpipes are dark and corroded, but this man's passion and his role in life was to polish that standpipe every morning. That was his joy. He knew that was his job, and he did it to the ultimate. And somebody asked him, he says, isn't this worthless? Isn't this subhuman that a human being comes out every day and polishes an inanimate standpipe? And this person, it would bring a tear to your eye. He said in ultimate modesty, he said, this is my job, and it sounds like a cliche, and I'm going to do it to the best of my ability. But then he added a comma. He said, this is my dream. The implication that you draw from that is, he did it to the best of his ability. It was a product of his work and effort and you know, when the sun came out and hit that standpipe, you had a very fabulous human being. He may not be a Rhodes Scholar, he may not have an IQ or be a member of Mensa, but he had an intuition about his being and about the role he played, whatever it was. And this is how you rise up 
from whatever antecedents through the age of evolution brought us to this part. Like the brain at first evolved, it was only the reptilian aspect. Later on, it was the, the uh, cerebellum. And now, ultimately, here we are on two legs with the cerebral aspect. And who knows what that will evolve to. But let me tell you this, whatever role you play in life, and whatever feelings you have about religion, and whatever feelings you have about politics, and about whatever feelings you have about mankind, you know something? We can reduce the tensions of the entire world into the size of this blue ball as it's seen by the Hubble telescope out in space, and we can reduce all the tensions of the world if each one of us step back and simplify and take a game as simple as handball, and if it's for us to make it part of our lives and make us better people to the people that we deal with. That's the real message of this. It's not about the Hall of Fame and about tournaments. Those are just wonderful things to be part of. The thing I got out of this game of handball is a sense of joy, a sense of being able to communicate with people a sense of seeing the world in a larger perspective. And I hope I leave that, just that thought with you. And next time, Matthew and I will continue on with more of his philosophical questions. It's been my pleasure to be with you, and I certainly look forward to the next time where we'll have joy in handling. Thank you.